prostate issues. Many men know about this, but an increasing number of young men are experiencing these problems, and women too. A physician scientist will be my guest in less than a minute to discuss this. I'll also be welcoming back David Grant, who will be going through part two of paying your taxes and financial literacy. But we begin with that problem that's faced so many men and some women. Dr. Wayne Graves, welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you. Thank you. Why are so many men experiencing prostate problems? I guess that's one of the troubles that men have. You know, women have to deal with breast cancer. Men have to deal with prostate cancer. And it is partly a result of the fact that as we age, our prostates get larger. As we get older, our immune system isn't as good. And so we are at risk for cancers in general. And for men, prostate cancer is one of the more important and more common ones. Talk about the issue of an enlarged prostate. How does someone get an enlarged prostate? Right. So as we age, the prostate tends to increase in size. And it's a normal process that occurs. And there's not a lot we can do about it. In some men, the enlargement occurs more rapidly and to a great extent than in others. But I think the statistics will show that as you get older, in your 60s, probably 60% 60 of men will have an enlarged prostate. In 70s, 70%, 70 and it goes on. So it's a pretty common occurrence that we don't have much control over. But younger men are having these prostate issues as well. Why is this? So the, the problems that the younger men have aren't as much the enlarged prostate, although that can happen. But what we are seeing that younger men, we are finding the occurrence of prostate cancer a bit earlier than we used to, particularly in black men. And so because of that, we are encouraging black men to start being screened for prostate cancer earlier. We're now saying at age 40. We used to say 45, even 50. You're a research scientist, and uh, there are many scientists that are saying that the issue of Black men getting cancer has got to be addressed. How do you address that? So I think there are several things that we can do in terms of addressing it. We know, for example, that if you detect prostate cancer early, the survival rate is very good. 99% of men, if the cancer is detected early, will live five years or more. So that's important. So the first thing that I think we need to do is to pay attention to early screening. Now, screening typically, typically involves a blood test we call the PSA, or test for prostate-specific antigen, and also a rectal exam. Now, many men are totally against having a rectal exam, so they put off both the rectal exam or the visit to the doctor because it usually entails both things. What we're trying to say, though, is that even if you don't go through with the rectal exam, at least ask your doctor to do a blood test, check your prostate-specific antigen, your PSA level. That alone would be a big step forward if we can do it. In addition, although the scientific evidence is not really very robust, we do know that there's benefit from following a plant-centric diet or predominantly plant-based diet. So it means cutting back on some kinds of foods like meats and dairy. We know that that's helpful in minimizing your risk. doesn't mean it puts it to zero, but it helps. So paying attention to your diet, early screening, and then the third factor that seems to be important is regular exercise. In fact, exercise, based on some of the newer data, seems to be even more important than the kind of diet we eat. So those three things, I think, are some things that we can do to begin to make some dent in this problem. I want to go back to the prostate issue problem. But before I do that, do women get prostate cancer? Not as far as I know, because women don't usually have prostates. That would be an anomaly. So we don't talk about women getting prostate cancer. 
which is different than saying men can get breast cancer because men have breasts and women get breast cancer, but it's not the reverse. It's not the same for men and women. I don't know if women get in prostate cancer, <laughs> at least not in the normal run of things. <laughs> okay. What are the symptoms of having an enlarged prostate or having prostate problems? That's an important question because the symptoms that a man has when he develops an enlarged prostate, they are almost identical to the kinds of symptoms that you get when you have prostate cancer. And in some men, there are no symptoms at all for a long, long time. When prostate cancer begins to cause symptoms, it is often far advanced. In an enlarged prostate, the symptoms, again, are similar. And the things that we see happen is that men have difficulty voiding, or they have a very slow stream. It's difficult to start urine flow. In rare cases, there are things like you know blood in the urine, although most commonly that may be due to problems with the kidneys and not necessarily the prostate, but that can be something. Some men will have pain on ejaculation. Some men will have backache. Sometimes the prostate is very enlarged. Or when they're spread to the bone, for example, there can be severe pain. But the earlier things that one finds with an enlarged prostate or sometimes with prostate cancer is difficult avoiding a slow stream, having to be up often at night going to the bathroom. But when those symptoms occur, it is more likely to be an enlarged prostate and not necessarily prostate cancer. But that is the time to be checked by a urologist or your doctor to try to figure out whether it's one or the other. And it may mean having a biopsy to be absolutely sure. You talked about having difficulty voiding, and you mentioned very slightly going to the bathroom often. Mm -hmm. These two things, difficulty voiding, but frequent urination. Talk about those two. Okay, right. So it happens in two ways. The prostate surrounds the ureter through which the urine flows. So as the prostate enlarges, it squeezes onto the urethra. So the flow is like a pipe being squeezed and making it narrower. So you can't void or you can't pee as fast. So your stream is narrower and slower. At night, what happens is that because the prostate is large and the press is on the bladder, there's not as much room for the bladder to hold onto the urine before it makes you go to the bathroom because there's little space now you're forced to empty sooner. So there are two things. One is a compression factor, if you will, and one is a space occupying factor. And those two things conspire to cause a slow stream or difficulty avoiding or you know, slow, and at night having to go more often because there's just not enough space to accommodate the urine. You just have to empty. Drink a water. What is your advice about drinking water? We are told that water is healthy, but for men who have prostate issues, uh, there are some restrictions. So what are those restrictions? So drinking water in general is a good habit to have. The difficulty though for men who have an enlarged prostate is that if you drink water near bedtime or if you drink any kind of fluid or drinks like coffee, coconut water, other things that tend to make you go to the bathroom. If you drink that near the bedtime, you can almost be sure that you're going to have to get up during the night to go to the bathroom, perhaps more often than you would normally. So we encourage people to try to go to the bathroom, go urinate just before you go to bed, and try not to drink a lot of fluids close to bedtime. People who are on hypertensive medications that we call diuretics also have that problem if they take them at nighttime because it also makes them go to the bathroom more often. So while water is good, the downside is that if you drink a lot of fluids or water near the bedtime, you are going to have to be up in the night if you have an enlarged prostate going to the bathroom more often. You're a research scientist, um, and uh, you do a lot of work with an organization called Merck. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a bit about your work yeah. with Merck. So my Merck, uh, Merck, Merck Research Labs here in Rahway is primarily in the infectious disease arena, HIV, you know, COVID, hepatitis C, all those things. So that's my primary research focus. 
but my focus when it comes to health education and health literacy is trying to get the message across to people of color that there's some diseases that are really rampant and devastating in our community. Prostate cancer is one, things like diabetes, hypertension, those are some of the big things, kidney disease, those are important problems that I feel compelled to address in addition to my research work. We talk about the importance of water and water being healthy. Um, what happens to those men uh, who have frequent urination while they are in bed? And obviously their sleep is being interrupted. But what do you say to those men? And um, what are the uses that would allow them to handle the frequent urination and not being able to get enough sleep? Yeah, that is a major problem. And there are medicines that we can use to help increase the flow. And there are medicines that we can use to help reduce things like incontinence. But there comes a time when the medicines don't work. And sometimes it requires some surgical intervention to decrease or shave off some of the size of the prostate to be able to deal with that problem. But there are many methods that are tried before we do that. And there's, there's some useful medicines that can be you know, the first or the second step, in addition to things like not drinking fluids, a lot of fluids around bedtime. There are things that can be done, but it's a progressive approach that we take before we get to the surgical intervention. Talk about the effects of this prostate issue on relationships. Um, a guy who was in a long-term relationship with his, his darling partner or who's married and, and uh, the effects on that married relationship. So these are all very good questions. And one uh, famous physician says, prostate cancer, for example, is a disease not just of the man, but of the whole family because it affects the family, it affects the wife. There are some men, for example, with prostate cancer who will have not only the symptoms that we talked about earlier, but they may have erectile dysfunction. That may be one of the ways that it presents, and so too with an enlarged prostate. So that's another way that I did mention before that we should be aware of. In addition to that, with prostate cancer, because the treatment really has complications, and there are two basic ways that is treated. One is with surgical intervention, you remove the prostate, what we call a radical prostatectomy, and then there's radiation therapy. And there are two major kinds of radiation. There's external radiation or internal radiation, which we know as seeds. The problem is that all these methods of treating prostate cancer can cause problems. You can have urinary incontinence. You can have erectile dysfunction from those. You can have also gastrointestinal problems. Different methods tend to cause more of some effects than the other. So in the end, you have to decide what are you comfortable with in terms of the side effects of treatment. For example, surgery, you can remove the whole prostate but the incidence of urinary problems afterwards and erectile dysfunction is a bit higher than if you go to wave radiation therapy. If you go to wave radiation therapy, the argument is that, well, then you can't easily do surgery, so people tend to do surgery first. But there is a sea change in the whole area, which I really want everyone to be aware of. If you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, and it's very early, very, very early stage, the approach that is now being recommended is what we call active surveillance, where you are monitored carefully every three or six months, getting your PSA checked, you know, maybe digital rectal exam, and about every year or year and a half, doing an MRI of the prostate. And what this does is that it allows you to postpone, assuming that you're at an early stage, it allows you to postpone the process of or the intervention to have surgery or radiation therapy. And the reason for this is that it avoids some of those complications I just mentioned. And the longer you can avoid those, then the man is going to be able to have, you know, good sexual relations with his wife, and everyone is happier. But it's not for everyone. But what I would say is this, that in the past, the minute a man was diagnosed with prostate cancer, there was a rush to do surgery or the rush to duration therapy. We're now in a different era where we want to look carefully at the biopsy results. We want to look at the MRI findings 
and a man may be able to go on for many years not needing radiation therapy or surgery if followed carefully and there is no progressive deterioration or increase in the PSA or the parameters when we look at MRI. That is so important. And I think that means so much to families, to men, their wives, their partners. If you can delay the onset of the aggressive forms of therapy, which comes with complications, no two ways about it. Dr. Graves, we spoke earlier about the fact that lots of black men get prostate cancer, but talk a bit more about that. We've only got about a minute and a half left. Right. While prostate cancer will affect one in eight white men, it will affect one in five or one in six black men. In addition, black men tend to develop prostate cancer earlier. It is more aggressive, and the mortality rate is two and a half times higher for black men with a prostate cancer compared to white men. So it is a very important disease for us to address among people of color in the black community. Okay, we are going to have you back uh, because we also want to address the question that's being raised in some circles that women tend to develop something called prostatitis. Is that is that what it's called? <laughs> So I see you're shaking your head. Yeah, so, that's a, that's another story, yes. <laughs> yes, so we are going to invite you back to, to discuss that story. And uh, we want to thank you for the information that you provided to our viewers here on Brooklyn 45. Thank you. Financial literacy. David Grant is with us again, and uh, we're going to be talking about the importance of financial literacy in building a skill set and a culture of money. Um, David, welcome to Brooklyn 45 again. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> in our last program, we talked about five principles of financial literacy. So let's do a quick review of those five principles. Okay, so we talked about that in the last segment, which is uh, the first one was earnings, which has to deal with income. The second one was savings and uh, building a nest egg investments. The third one was protection, which deals with insurance or uh, protection of your assets. Uh, the other one was spending and budgeting, which has to do with your spending habits and how you're budgeting your spending. And of course, the last one is borrowing and debt, which a lot of us assume debt. Uh, credit cards to pay for certain things, but we need to be mindful of how that can explode exponentially <laughs> and drive us into uh, further trouble. So let's talk a bit more about borrowing and debt. And there are two aspects of borrowing and debt that I want you to talk about and the tax implications for the two of them. Okay, so with borrowing and debt, um, usually people have uh, credit cards uh, in which uh, sometimes they have interest rates that are high and you can end up, you know, owing a lot of money on them. But more importantly, uh, there is an issue from a tax point of view of when you have debt that is canceled, uh, meaning that there is a forgiveness of the debt that most people don't know that uh, when you cancel the debt in most instances that that becomes income to you in the year that uh, the debt is canceled. So it means that, let's say for instance, uh, in 2023, if you uh, had debt that was canceled, it could be canceled for various reasons, a modification of a loan in which some of the loan was, uh, you know, uh, the loan was written off or whatever that portion now becomes income to you the next year that you file your taxes. This can cause uh, tax implications because it means then that this might be income because it's gross that adds on to your additional income, which means that you may end up owing money at the end of the year, something that you may not have foreseen because maybe you didn't talk to a tax advisor such as myself. But that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is uh, student loan interest. Now, in in most recent years, there was the uh, 
the ARPA, which was the American Rescue Protection Act, which was passed in 2021. What that act stated was that a lot of the student loans from 2021 to 2025, even though uh, debt, when it's canceled, can become income to you, anyone that incurred uh, forgiveness of those loans in those years and in 2025, those on the federal side uh, will not be income to you. They will be exempted. So that's good news for uh, a lot of people that um, got loans forgiven. The and that's, time, yeah. Go on. You said you yeah. said the federal side, but continue. Right. So the state side also, the states have control over whether they want to follow the federal. <laughs> it's not automatic. So the state decides whether or not they want to follow the federal. And under the ARPA, which again is the American Rescue Plan um, Act, uh, most states have decided to follow the federal. The good news is, is that New York, New Jersey, and most of the surrounding um, states all are going to follow the federal, which means that they would not um, include that income on your state taxes also. So that's the good news. So let's talk a bit more about the loan forgiveness programs. We hear these the information on radio and television all the time about loan forgiveness programs and having to go to an attorney. <laughs> right. um, but talk a bit about that. So the loan forgiveness programs can, um, without going into too, too much in depth to it, uh, a lot of loans are forgiven sometimes if you work in the public service. Um, certain nurses and uh, certain teachers. Um, it could be a provision in their contract where if you work, uh, if you paid 120 payments and you've worked 10 years for that company, a portion of the loan can be forgiven. Also, there's military people that, um, that also they've worked many years in the military. They also can be given loans that are forgiven also. And there's a whole host of reasons why loans can be forgiven. Uh, in terms of the private with the credit cards, you can have loans that are forgiven because foreclosures, uh, somehow the, the, the person can't repay the debt. So the debt is forgiven. But in all those cases, you have to see whether or not there's a provision on the tax component side, whether that will become income to the person when the loan is forgiven. Uh, what ref what um, referrals are necessary um, to resource information? So referrals as in? Well, referral to a, a tax specialist like yourself okay. or referrals referrals to the city to the city or the state. Right. Well, like in any anything that one of the reasons that we're educating people on this is to have good tax planning. And I know a lot of people are sometimes they do taxes on their own, but in terms of, you know, having this knowledge of whether or not a loan is forgiven or not is wise to seek out someone like myself, because then you can do some tax planning and you don't get caught off guard, <laughs> so to speak, when you go to file your taxes and then you find out that you owe, which is not always a, a nice uh, feeling to have at that time. But it's always good to, you know, whether it's uh, anything that has a tax implication for you, you should always seek the advice of a tax specialist where, such as myself or others, where they can give you some um, information so as to be proactive in when you do come to file your taxes, you might have something in place that minimize that tax um, impact to your um, tax return. What's important to know and remember regarding tax filing and the timing of both your preparation and the actual filing? So the actual filing, uh, just make sure that uh, you have all your documents together. Um, if you are such a person that is aware of what documents you had the prior year, uh, make sure that you receive all those documents from the prior year. Um, if you are in between um, accountants, always make sure to bring a copy of your tax return to the to the current accountant because there certainly could be certain information like carry forwards from the year before 
that normally would impact the return, but the current tax uh, preparer wouldn't know about that. Also, uh, you know, um, be mindful now that uh, a lot of taxes are done through our uh, secure uh, sites. Uh, for me, I have people upload stuff to secure sites. So a lot of times you're not, you know, um, you're probably on a Zoom with a, a taxpayer. So you're not face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, um, uploading documents to secure locations. And just be mindful that the the way tax preparation is unfolding throughout the years, a lot of the electronic um, devices are being used to be able to uh, prepare your taxes. So there are a lot of people that are being brought, kicking and screaming into the, the new way <laughs> of doing it, but just be prepared to uh, have that. And people need to be aware of changes and or do they just, when they meet with you, you let them know what those changes are that will affect their taxes. Right. Well, most of the changes have to do with the filing statuses, um, which are marred filing jointly, marred filing separately, head of household, qualifying widower, um, and single. A lot of those uh, those statuses change with the inflation. They go up every year, so you would have an increase in deduction. Um, if you have any children that were born in the prior year, you know, make sure that they have social security numbers. But once you come, we will, you know, avail ourselves of, you know, bringing you up to speed on anything. And we would ask the relevant questions as to what happened to you during the year. It's sort of like taxes is sort of like taking uh, a medical history before you actually treat the patient. You have to know the history before you can actually prepare the taxes. It's a great way of looking at it. <laughs> on behalf of our viewers and on behalf of our taxpayers, I want to thank you, David Grant, enrolled agent for the information that you provided here on Brooklyn 45. Thank you for having me again. Thank you, David Grant, and thank you, Dr. Wayne Graves. And to you, our viewers, we thank you for watching this program. We invite you to partner with Brooklyn 45. You can do this in many different ways. We are a 501c3 TV program. So when you support us with a donation, you benefit and our communities benefit as well. So please tell all your friends to watch us on Brooklyn 45, on cable TV and uh, on our YouTube channels. On behalf of our Brooklyn 45 team, I am Sam Tate. Brooklyn 45 is a 501c3 not-for-profit, and we welcome your support. Check out our website, brooklyn45.com, and feel free to donate or share it with your friends and family. Have any comments or questions? Send them to our Facebook, facebook.com slash brooklyn45tv. If you have any questions or topics you think we should cover next, shoot me an email over at brooklyn45tv at gmail.com. Thank you again for watching.